The reason that a ring bank has been selected for Westport is because the scope that the engineering team was given was to provide protection from inundation, from river flooding, for at least a one in 100 um, year average return interval event. We started work on this actually going back a long way. There was initial investigations done around 2010 and then my firm was brought in to do more detailed investigation in 2014. And we had a Buller working group in 2014 and one of the first things that we started looking at was whether or not a full ring bank would be required to provide flood protection to Westport. We looked at um, only having partial banks and leaving some sections of, of the ring bank open uh, where the land is slightly higher. But unfortunately what we found as we ran different iterations of the model with different combinations of flow as well as tide scenarios that it was not possible to provide a full level of protection to a 1 in 100 year return period level of service without providing a full ring bank. And the reason for that is, is quite simple. We've got extreme flood risk from the Buller River. Um, we have extreme flood risk from the Orowaiti overflow. And we also have severe flood risk coming from the coast. So because we're getting attacked essentially from all sides, the only way to provide a reliable and resilient protection to Westport is by providing a full ring bank. We also need to account for what we call model freeboard. Uh, model freeboard accounts for uncertainty. No model is perfect. Um, this is standard for all rivers around the country. And so for the Westport example, we've allowed 0 0.6 metres or some people say 600 millimetres of additional freeboard. Now this allows for future uncertainty. Things such as bed levels change, river alignment changes, uh, land use changes etc in the future we don't know what's going to happen in the future so we have to make some assumptions that something will likely change over the next 50 to 100 years so we've we have an allowance for for uncertainty within the model design and that is another reason why why a full ring bank needs to be selected The Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change is a multinational, international um, body which works through the United Nations um, at assessing the potential impacts of climate change. The IPCC, as they are known, has a, a range of potential future climate scenarios which they consider. Nobody knows what's going to happen with climate change, uh, how severe the impacts are going to be or what the actual rate is of change is going to be as it depends on a wide number of factors. The IPCC has given a, a range of potential future climate scenarios and they are given a term called a representative concentration pathway. Now the representative concentration pathway considers different projections of future carbon emissions. For example, do we continue business as usual for the next 100 years and continue to accelerate our burning of fossil fuels? Or do we work together as, you know, the different countries around the world work at reducing their carbon emissions? So there's different potential future climate scenarios um, and they're given different names. Um, we have selected RCP6, which is one potential future climate scenario, and we're looking at the potential future emissions at the end of the century. Those potential emission scenarios have then been modelled by the expert scientists at NIWA and they have provided us predictions around what the likely flow rates are in the river. And so a decision was made by the political leaders um, in the West Coast that they wish to have a consistent level of service for Westport to a 1 in 100 year average return interval event to an RCP6 future climate scenario to the end of the century. Um, so that also incorporates sea level rise. We've actually looked at sea level rise projections uh, also developed by the IPCC um, out to 2120. And that is due to requirements under the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement to assess um, coastal impacts out to a 100 year time frame. Um, so due to that requirement, we have modelled those flows and that level of sea level rise. And that is what the full design is based on. So a design exceedance event is, the, is an event which is larger than the design flow or potentially coastal flooding um, more severe than has been designed for. So we've, we've designed up to what we believe is a, is a 1 in 100 year average return interval um, event 
for a future climate out to the end of the century using the RCP6 flows. If we had an event which was larger than that, then we can expect that the banks will overtop. We've modelled a number of these scenarios using you know, quite significant flows as well as coastal boundary conditions to see what would happen should the banks overtop. And one thing which we can be reassured by is that if the banks were to overtop, the degree of flooding is expected to be less than it would have been if there were no banks there in the first place. So that's the first thing is that we will have flooding, it, it will be quite bad, but it will be less than it would have been if there was no banks. However, um, what will we do in this scenario? Um, we have a ring bank and so the water will be trapped, it won't be, it won't be able to escape um, and will still be hazardous. So one good thing which the Regional Council has been investing in um, is we, they currently have a contract with NIWA who are developing an advanced flood warning system for Westport. So it's currently a five year project um, they're putting a lot of, lot of effort, their team of scientists and hydrologists uh, are trying to improve their system so that they can provide a reliable flood forecast for, for Westport. Um, so one of the key things will be flood forecast. Um, if there is significant and uh, a significant warning that is giving a high level of certainty that there's going to be a larger than design event, then, then it would likely that Westport would still need to be evacuated. Um, but at the same time, there will be sections of the bank which have been designed in a way that they can be quickly demolished um, so that water can be let out. So that would have to occur either during the event at the start of the overtopping or ideally even before it overtopped so that that water can get out straight away and we'd have an evacuation plan. But all of those finer details will be will come out in the detailed design stage. So all of those things at the moment are conceptual. They've been thought about, they've been discussed, but the finer details of evacuation plans um, and sacrificial sections of the bank will, will be put together in a detailed design section of the project. So based on, on the current design, um, the entire um, stop banks as well as flood walls can be adapted and can be raised in the future should they be needed if climate change projections for example are more severe than currently anticipated or if um, if the future community wishes for a higher level of protection than one in 100 years so the earth uh, stop banks have been designed in a way that they have a very wide footprint the the batter slope or the side slopes has been designed at two to one um, and there's a there's a six metre wide um, crest width in most locations, in some locations four metres. Um, however, the advantage of this is that if we want to increase the height in the future, it's quite easy to do so. For the wooden walls, um, you, will have, you will be aware that most of the, of the flood walls have actually been designed to be constructed from wood. And one of the advantages of wood, there's many advantages of wood, um, one of them is resilience in earthquakes, but another one is that it's actually very easy to increase the height of a wooden wall, whereas a concrete structure is much harder to raise. So we believe one of the advantages of the wooden structures is they are more adaptable in the future. So groundwater intrusion is a concern for, for certain areas of Westport and by constructing the flood walls we won't have any impact on on the groundwater so it's an issue which is going to be there in the future regardless of any any flood walls which are constructed um, there are sections very low-lying sections of westport for example the snodgrass area some of the areas around the orawaiti where we would expect as as sea level continues to rise that groundwater will will concurrently rise also so there will be sections of Westport which will need to start thinking about managed retreat over the long term um, and, and that is independent of these flood walls. Dredging of the river is something which has been talked about um, for a very long time in Westport. It's actually been carried out um, going back decades, you know, there's, there's records of dredging in the river in the, in the 1950s. The, most of the dredging which has been carried out to date has been for the purpose of, of port management, of maintaining ship access. 
Um, very interesting records of the Harbour Masters back in the 1960s have recorded that at times they were dredging heavily for say 14 days in a row and they found that the that the bar height was actually increasing not decreasing and at other times they weren't dredging and 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 the river was degrading so what they found was that well actually you're spending a lot of money for for very little benefit um, dredging is very expensive the Buller River is a very large and very powerful river and during a flood event the Buller River will do what it wishes to do and if it needs to transport a large volume of water to sea the velocities are, are exceptionally high um, in that it transports a large amount of gravel and so what we found in the recent flood event in July 2021 was that the bed level in the Buller River actually dropped significantly in locations and it also got wider in the, in, in the areas where it didn't drop the river is actually it, it eroded the banks by about 20 metres so the river made room for itself. Um, during a flood event, a river is often scouring out a lot of material, so the bed actually drops during a flood event. Um, but as the water slows down at the end of the flood, the sediment falls back out of the water and the river fills back up. So it appears that nothing has happened, but the river has actually made room for itself. So it's not believed. We've had expert opinion from a number of very experienced river engineers who are involved in gravel extraction activities around the country. And, and the advice has been that gravel extraction is unlikely to have any impact on, on flood carrying capacity for the Buller River. Not only that, gravel extraction in the Buller River is very expensive. We're talking about millions of dollars per year and in terms of a cost benefit analysis, the flood walls come out as a significantly better um, cost benefit. So the cost to the ratepayer is, is much less using flood walls rather than having an, a very expensive ongoing gravel extraction program. So Organs Island is the area where the Buller River first overflows and the majority of the flows which head down the Orawati overflow towards town um, through the Snodgrass area come from the Orawati overflow at Organs Island. The Organs Island was actually the original path of the Buller River as some of you may have seen in my previous presentations um, and this river was diverted in the 1890s down the current path but as a result because the Relic River Channel, as it's being referred to, is still there, that's the natural fall of the land and that's where the river naturally wants to go. When it was originally diverted, the engineer at the time wrote some detailed documents explaining that it's his intention that the Organs Island area should be heavily vegetated. Um, it should be heavily vegetated. He had actually said in blackberries and willows. The reason why he chose blackberries and willows is that they have a very strong root density and they're very dense vegetation which would trap a lot of water. It would slow the velocity of the water down, slow that speed down and when, when water slows the sediment which it's carrying often drops out. So as the sediment drops out it spreads over the land and then after that flood that land is maybe 100 mil higher and then, and then if you've got dense native vegetation, for example, it will drop its seed and that will start planting up that land. And then five years later we get another flood, more silt drops out and that land will slowly rise. And so it's a, it's a very clever um, and actually sophisticated natural uh, technique for, for flood mitigation um, using vegetation. So we believe it would have many advantages. It is difficult to model accurately because we don't know how quickly that land will grow and exactly how dense the vegetation will be. But we've made some assumptions and have assessed that we can reduce the amount of floodwaters going down the Orawaiti towards that Snodgrass area in the order of 10%. And it's more effective with bigger flows. So during a climate change event, we get even more than 10%. We're reducing the percentage of water which is heading down towards the Snodgrass area, which will have many benefits. A secondary benefit um, of that is also around natural river management. At the moment we're using large rock at Organs Island to protect the bank and to hold that river in place. One of the advantages of turning that whole area into a native vegetation reserve 
is that over time the regional council will be able to step away from using as much rock and doing such hard management of the structure and allow for a more natural migration of the river through the Organs Island area because the vegetation will, will act as a buffer and can hold the river in place to a degree. And so there's, there's benefits in reducing the flow, but also in actually having a significant reduction in management cost um, and effort required from the regional council, which is an advantage for the, for the ratepayer, obviously, because that will over time uh, reduce the amount needed to be spent on maintenance of, of large volumes of rock. So it's been suggested that, that Abattoir Creek could be realigned. Um, at the moment it drains into Cats Creek and as, as you're aware there's a lot of development around there, um, a lot of new development in fact, and, and it goes through the railway line and into the newly developed area and that area is significantly flood prone. Quite a simple, small piece of work. There's, there's significant fall um, and it's been suggested that why don't we just divert that creek away from the newly developed area and away from the residential housing and it can drain on the other side of the railway line down into the Orawati. Uh, so quite a simple fix, localised impacts only, but it seems a sensible solution just to reduce a bit of that local stormwater flooding particularly, as well as overflows from the Orawati River as to heading into the, into the area of urban development. So we have no major changes to any of the drains planned as part of the current scheme. Remembering that we're only in the preliminary design stage and once funding is confirmed this, the project would move into a detailed design stage. The only changes which we're currently anticipating for drains is where they're going to interact with the floodwalls. Um, so if they are crossing through where the floodwalls are, then, then we've allowed for, for large culvert structures which will have some form of valve or a flap gate on them to prevent backflow. And other than that, there may be some locations which would be planned as part of the detailed design where we may wish to optimise the outlets of the drains. For example, if there are two drains very close to each other, um, rather than having two crossings through a stop bank, we may we may choose to um, merge them into a single outlet. However, that would, that would occur at a detailed design stage and, and would be in consultation with the landowners on whose land those drains are crossing. One of the options which was, which was modelled as part of the options investigation was putting um, an increased opening width through the Stevens Road railway embankment it has been noted um, that there were observations during the July 2021 flood event that that railway embankment was overtopping and actually partially collapsed in locations and there was a sudden deluge downstream. Um, that has been noted and taken into account as part of the design of the overall scheme, but what the modelling showed was that providing an additional opening um, into the railway embankment at that location didn't have a significant impact on flood levels downstream and very localised impacts on flood levels upstream. We modelled a 100 metre wide opening as part of our investigations. So basically the cost benefit of doing that was not there. We, we couldn't see an overall scheme benefit apart from a very localised impact. So there may be some benefits to Kiwi Rail, for example, and, and putting an additional opening in there, if it, if it increases the resilience of their assets, if they wish to maintain their asset in the future. And so we, we do not have any objection to any work being done there in the future. Um, however, in terms of benefits, scheme-wide benefits, which we were considering as part of the overall design, the, the benefit simply wasn't there. So it hasn't been recommended as part of this overall scheme, but we're not ruling out any work being done there in the future and would have no objection to working in with any local infrastructure um, owners, for example, Kiwi Rail or even NZTA, who, who have a, a roading embankment upstream of the railway, which is also causing a, an obstruction to the flow. So another option which was modelled as part of our options investigation was 
removing the obstruction to the flow which is the causeway at the Orowaiti um, State Highway Bridge. So that would be done by putting culverts under the existing embankment. But what the modelling actually found was that because that causeway is actually so low, it's currently overtopping an event's between a 10 and 20 year event as it is, it's not actually providing as much of an obstruction to flow as, as we originally thought. So we had a, a very minor benefit, um, less than a benefit in terms of reducing flood levels around by 10 centimetres upstream of the bridge by removing that obstruction, but the significant cost that would be required, as well as the complications around working in a, a mud estuary area, the cost benefit simply wasn't there, it would be cheaper to, to raise the flood walls rather than, than modify the causeway crossing the Orowaiti estuary. So the, the design which has been put forward for, for the flood banks and the walls is a combination of different construction materials. We've got three basic types, we've got earth embankment, we've got wooden um, retaining wall type structures as well as a, a short section of concrete wall. Um, and there's different reasons why these have been selected. Now, the most standard type of structure used for, for a stop bank in New Zealand um, and around the world is just a simple compacted gravel earth embankment. We've selected this for the majority of the area because we've got material readily available on site. We've, we can take material from the Buller River, for example. We can take, we can take silts and sand material required for the construction um, from, from around the catchment. There's, there's really, really access to material. And these structures are well tested, they're strong, they're resilient. Um, and they can be easily repaired if they're, if they're damaged, for example, earthquake damage, or, or maybe they need to be raised in the future. They're, they're, they're very easy to construct and well understood, as well as resilient. They're very good at holding back floodwaters and well tested. We have other areas, however, where there's, the space is not available in order to construct a, an earth embankment. An earth embankment requires a significant footprint. Um, and some areas around the edge of the Orowaiti estuary simply do not have the space and so we've opted for flood walls. Now it's well known that, that there is significant earthquake risk within, within the Westport area. There's been, there's been historical earthquakes back in the 20s and the 60s um, and there's, there is a risk of, of liquefaction. Some consideration was put into that and it was, it was felt that a wooden structure has an advantage of being more resilient in an earthquake. Wood is flexible whereas concrete is brittle. Um, and because of the significant earthquake risk, the design requirements for a concrete structure are higher and we would need quite a large um, concrete foundation. Putting in a large concrete foundation is, has quite significant impact. You need to excavate quite a large area and use quite a large amount of material. So. The TAG um, took all of these things into consideration and has put forward the recommendation of, of wooden walls. Another advantage is the wooden walls can be easily repaired um, should they be damaged and they can easily be raised. We've got two types of wooden walls in the areas where there's the least amount of space available. We've adopted for a, what we call a single wall. So that's just a single, um, single layer wooden, wooden retaining wall, tongue and groove boards. Um, designed in a way that it will be watertight um, as well as structurally designed to be able to take the load of the water and to, to, to basically withhold any, any pressures from the earth, for example. Um, and the most resilient of the flood wall structures which we're proposing is a double, is a double wooden wall. So we're proposing a, a double wooden wall structure with some bracing with a compacted earth fill in between. And that's, that's where there's a little bit more space available is the most resilient of, of the options. However, the single wall will still be designed in a way where it will be sufficiently resilient. So there's a section on the Buller River um, where we've allowed for concrete wall. Uh, the concrete wall has been selected as being more appropriate for that location due to the specifics of the, um, of the ground materials in that location, as well as the fact that the Buller River is a, is a much more powerful river and the, 
the design characteristics for a wall adjacent to the Buller River differ from that on the banks of the Arawati. So one of, again, one of the options uh, investigated as part of our options investigation was allowing the water to spill through the snodgrass area by excavating a, a causeway um, or essentially a, a, a cut through a large portion of, of the snodgrass area. The modelling investigation showed this would have some benefit, but the benefit wasn't as large as hoped. Um, additionally, technically it would be very difficult to, to construct. We still have a road access crossing the Snodgrass Road, so that section of road would need to be either culverted or bridged, which would come at significant cost. We've also got significant area of gravel fill which has been put in over the years in parts of the Snodgrass area, and the cost benefit again was simply not there. It would be very difficult and expensive to remove all of that gravel, and in addition to that we're running through private property, so essentially the council would have had to have purchased um, purchased the land, bought those properties out in order to excavate a channel through. So the disruption to the local residents as well as the cost of doing that was considered very significant and the benefits to the overall scheme were were relatively minor in the in the larger scheme of things and so it was decided not to not to proceed with that option. So the Orowati cut is something which has been investigated in actually a large amount of detail since at least 2014. I was actually the person responsible for putting that forward as part of the options investigations in 2014 and, and do put my hand up to say that I've been a strong proponent for a cut for many years. Um, however, one of the things that we have to do as an engineer um, when we're working with a large group of experts is sometimes realise, hey, just because we're enthusiastic about something, once we start talking to other experts and realise that there's a large number of pros and cons and people speaking to engineers who have experience at building these cuts, sometimes we have to eat a bit of humble pie and realise that, okay, maybe this suggestion was not the, was not the ideal solution in this, in this location. And we've had engineers come in and, and carry out investigations for us, talk to the group. They've got many decades of experience of operating um, large river cuts around the country. And the advice that, that we received is that the Orowati area is not the ideal for a cut. There's not significant fall out to sea. The Buller River has a, has a very large tidal profile, so we get some very high tides. So therefore the benefits of the cut are, are not really there during a high tide phase and, and the nature of the Buller River floods is that, they, is that they're often a 24, 48 hour flood so we're definitely going to be coinciding with a, with a high tide. The cut would have to be very wide um, in order to transport capacity. We have modelled a range of cuts which do show benefit. The cost however was very significant. We were looking at in the order of $5 million just for excavation alone but then what has been highlighted to us is that it's not just putting the cut in place, it's long-term maintenance. The, the cut will naturally want to silt back up due to the nature that it's in a coastal marine area. Putting in a cut exposes Westport to more coastal flooding, tsunami risk, as well as just your storm surge and cyclones, for example, Cyclone Fahey. Um, so therefore the cut would need to be blocked off, probably at both ends. Opening up that cut would take significant time and there would be a risk that if there wasn't enough warning, the cut may not actually be opened up in time to be to be efficient. Uh, one further problem is that, as as you may have seen in some of my earlier um, my earlier presentations, is that the coastline is actually growing at the Arawati, and it's been growing for, since the early 1900s. Um, due to the fact that that will keep growing, it's going to become harder and harder to keep the cut open. In addition, with sea level rise. Uh, sea level is rising, it's on record, the Westport tide gauge itself shows that we've got um, a significant rate of sea level rise occurring, the cut will become less and less efficient over time. So after much debate and discussion, the TAG came to the conclusion that, that we should abandon further investigation for an Orowati cut. At 
As part of the technical investigations, uh, we carried out detailed analysis in what is the impact of protecting Snodgrass Road. One of the, of the things that we found was that by providing protection to Snodgrass Road, we were actually forcing the entire Orawati overflow through a very narrow channel, a very constricted channel, before it has to do a 90 degree turn and head out to sea. As a result of that significant restriction which we would be causing, we actually found that we had quite a severe adverse impact on the upstream landowners. And so we actually found that water levels would be increased for a, for a 1 in 100 year return event with a RCP6 design standard, which is the standard we were asked to, to design to, we found we were increasing water levels by up to 75 centimetres on, on those farmers and landowners up the Orawati overflow who are currently living there and are currently farming there. And we found that overall increase in the order of between 0.6 and 0.8 of a metre of water level increase extended over a period of about two kilometres. So firstly we're increasing the water levels by between 0.6 and 0.8 of a metre over two kilometres but that actually carried on for between six and eight kilometres further upstream and slowly tapered off to zero but we're increasing the water levels on all of the landowners upstream of Snodgrass Road um, for about eight kilometres. So the, the first reason why we are cautious about providing um, protection to Snodgrass is that we end up having to choose who is more important, are the Snodgrass residents more important or are the residents who are living upstream. Um, and as a technical person, that's not the type of decision which I make. And so we just simply advise that by providing protection to Snodgrass, we are increasing the water levels upstream. And a secondary effect of increasing the water levels upstream is that the stop banks for the Arawaiti section of the bank, on the true left of the Arawaiti, have to be higher. And so design uh, investigations have shown that the stop bank on the Arawaiti would actually be 0.6 metres higher. Um, and that actually has a significant in increase on cost on the overall project. So we'll increase the cost. We're looking at an order of one and a half to two million dollar increase in cost. In addition to that, we're reducing the amenity value to the local residents on the Arawaiti. So the local residents who may have a 1.5 metre high flood wall in front of their property would now have a 2.1 or even higher metre wall. So it starts becoming something you can no longer see over the top of. So we're increasing the flood waters on the residential and the farmland upstream and we're also making the flood walls for the other residents along the Orawaiti estuary significantly higher. Two reasons. We did have advice, professional advice in terms of resource consenting that because we're having such a severe um, increase in flood levels upstream that it would be very difficult if not impossible to get resource consent um, for that. In addition to that, because the, there's such limited space in the Snodgrass area the, and the stop bank the stop banks need to be so high, we're looking at heights in excess of three metres um, running down the road immediately downstream of the Orawati Bridge. And because the stop banks have two to one slopes, that actually becomes a very wide structure. Um, and that structure will have to be built in the estuary um, itself. Now that estuary is classified as, a, as an estuary of, of national significance. Working in an area of national uh, estuary of national significance um, is very difficult in terms of resource consenting, and so whether or not it would get consent, if it would get consent, it would it would be it would be a very difficult operation to construct in there, um, without having severe adverse impacts on the coastal marine area. With rising sea level, um, which we're already observing and is forecast to accelerate. Um, we would expect the Snodgrass area to be the first area to be impacted from rising groundwater levels. It's the lowest land within the Westport, um, the Westport general catchment and we would expect that even if we are providing flood walls we're going to start receiving significant inundation during periods of, of high tides. For example the king tides in the coming years are going to get higher and higher 
Um, so even though we would be investing many millions of dollars in providing flood protection to the Snodgrass residents, the residents may find that they're still getting flooded due to severe groundwater inundation. Consideration was given, or discussion was had at least around providing a lower level of protection to the Snodgrass residents, but because we're putting a ring bank around the area, that has a lot of risk. And so if we only provide 20 year level of protection and, and that overtops, then to allow those floodwaters out, we'd have to demolish a large sections of the bank, um, which starts to come at significant cost and significant disruption and, and wouldn't be preventing um, inundation anyway. So in the end, it's a very complex decision. The decision is ultimately a political decision. Um, however, from a technical point of view, there are, there are significant reasons why one would avoid providing protection to the to the Snodgrass area. How that how that how that is dealt with is ultimately a a political decision in the end of the day though.